Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's interview, I speak with Bernhard Rötzl from Germany, who has written the world famous gentleman book, which sold over 1 million copies. And we'll talk about his books, how you can dress like a gentleman and anything else of interest. Bernhard, welcome to the Gentleman's Gazette. Hello, Raphael. It's good to be here. Wonderful. Thank you for, for joining us, Bernhard. Thank you. Before we start, tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you got into men's clothing. Well, um, I am by profession um, a copywriter. I used to work in advertising. I have studied um, graphic design in the 1980s. And um, menswear, menswear was always my, my passion, my hobby my pastime and uh, since I was a schoolboy and when other young guys went to Spain or the south of France on their vacation I traveled places like London or Paris which is fortunately very close to, to Germany and, and, and educated myself by walking around in the streets by looking at menswear stores by looking at uh, vintage clothes shops. Uh, I went to flea markets. I hunted clothes like other people hunt souvenirs in Spain or Italy. And um, but I never ever thought of of making this uh, profession. And uh, I just was a clothes nut, so to speak, uh, a man passionate about clothes and especially handmade clothes. You know, I I found that handmade clothes from days gone by were much more fascinating than what I found in the stores in the 1980s. Okay, and you know, you did this at a time when the internet was really not around. That was late 80s, early 90s. Where did you learn about that stuff and handmade clothes? Well, I learned like people had learned uh, many hundred years before in history. I learned by reading actual books. I learned by uh, by walking around and going to places and by speaking to to trade to tradesmen to craftsmen to tailors shoemakers this is how i gathered my my knowledge you know it's not like today where you can just uh, go out go on the internet and have you can go to fantastic uh, websites like the one you run and find everything out i really had to go to places i had to go to bookstores to antique bookshops and find all these wonderful books that were around or had been around for a hundred years. Once you knew all of this, and it sounds like, you know, clothing was a big hobby for you, how did you come up with the idea to write a book? Well, writing had been my profession since 1992 when I started working in advertising, but I never wrote about menswear. Until one day I walked around in, in a museum um, in Bonn, which was then the German capital, and I found a book on European cuisine. And it, it gathered everything from France, Italy, Spain, and all the good things from these countries. And I, I thought, well, this could be done with menswear as well. I could do a book that gathered the best from every country. This was my basic idea. And then I just looked inside the book. I looked for the name of the publisher and I went home. I wrote a letter with, an, with a real typewriter. That is something that many young people are not familiar with anymore. They see it in movies. You know, you actually type, which is a physical effort. And I wrote a letter, sent it to Cologne, which is near your hometown, I believe. Not and, quite, uh, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> not, not, not your present home time. I think you're from Düsseldorf, or where are you from? No, I'm originally from Schwäbisch Hall in uh, Baden-Württemberg. I thought you were from Düsseldorf, sorry. No problem. Schwäbisch Hall is much more exciting than Düsseldorf, of course. <laughs> Everybody who's from Germany understands these little jokes. <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I sent a letter to Cologne, and I was invited, to my surprise, by the publisher, immediately he said come to my office i want to speak to you about this project and to cut a long story short or to make a short story even shorter he said it looks great your concept go ahead and you know i had sold my project probably by my clothes which proves what i always say and what probably you would agree with that clothes, good clothes open doors. You know, he, he had never heard about 
me, he just saw me walking in his office, saw my office, uh -huh. he saw my office, and he probably thought this guy is crazy, but let's give him a chance. Because uh, your clothes made a statement and, and spoke for your yeah. message, so it was believable, yeah. basically. If I and had more sneakers seriously. and a hoodie and and or a track pant or whatever or, or ill-fitting suit, you might have thought this guy does not know what he's talking about because the publisher was a very well-dressed man. I must say this, you know, he was a very, very, very nice double-breasted Italian suits and handmade shoes from Hungary. So, how would you define? gentleman style that's a very good question and a very complicated question at the same time it's very difficult to define um, last week i was in vienna and i asked the same question when i spoke to a tailor and he said a gentleman dresses in a way that is never exaggerated you know it's it's not too much color not too many loud patterns uh, it's always well proportioned um, and he gave me an example of a gentleman that he knows from Vienna who still wears suits from the late 60s and even suits from the late se or from the 70s when off the rack suits had wide lapels and so on and if you have a well proportioned suit and if the, suit, if, if the cloth is not too thin you can really wear it for a long long time and he even applied this princip principle of not exaggerating to the behavior of the gentleman and, and I really agreed I think a gentleman is someone who um, who doesn't have fits of, of anger in public who doesn't laugh too loud you know he's he's always you know he he gives an air or uh, of, of being in, in the middle of or emotionally in the middle of the road if you can say this in English I don't know if you understand me but he's you know, it's not like yeah, this and up and down, but always in the middle and, you know, which gives, a which makes it nice to be with him. And it's the same with clothes, you know, if, imagine you, you were, you could wear a, a tie that was really loud and, and bright red, but you've got a tie on which is slightly toned down because it would draw away the attention from your face if you had a tie that was too loud. And this is all that it is about. We just discussed the close part and we talk a little bit about you know patterns and loud and then you just alluded to it a gentleman is more than just his clothes other than his mood what other aspects do you think are an essential part of a gentleman well i think um good behavior again is is not only about knowing rules you know many people think that they attend a course and they learn how to eat oysters or uh, how to taste wine in a proper manner to not, you know, uh, embarrass themselves. Yeah, or embarrass uh, their wife or their date or whatever, or their colleagues. This is true, of course. But I find that men who really are gentlemen sometimes do not know these things. You know, if if you if you know how to behave yourself, or if you if you're a polite person, you can always ask the waiter and say, "Sorry, I, I never had this dish before. Could you please explain?" Or you could watch people how they do it. But there's nothing embarrassing about not knowing how to eat um, uh, an oyster if you never had one before. I think it's not embarrassing. It's much more embarrassing if you if you sit at a restaurant table and a lady approaches the table and if you do not get up i find it essential to get up for a lady i find it essential to open a door for 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 anyone who comes after you i find it essential to be polite to to the person who cleans your room or, or the one who cleans your car and um, real gentlemen are polite with everyone and not polite only to people that are their superiors you know and that's one of the secrets and everything else can be learned. It's it's um, it's 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 a very difficult task, you know, to be a gentleman. And I think it's also human that even a gentleman is sometimes not a gentleman because we are all human beings and nobody is perfect. But at least trying is a good thing. And I find it very sad that nowadays many young people are not educated this way because if you don't educate people, they don't know it, you know. Yeah. So when you wrote your book. You know, and it's titled The Gentleman. Who was your intended audience at the time? Well, um, again, a very good question. To be really honest, um, I never thought about an audience at that stage. I just thought, I want to show 
whoever looks at this book later, how fantastic this world of classic menswear is, because I find it so interesting that every piece or every single item has a history and it's all about, and there's, it's, it's, every product is, is useful, you know, it's not, it's, it's 10% fashion and 90% uh, usefulness. But um, when the title came up, and again, I have to admit that I didn't make it up. <laughs> I must admit that people at the publishing house, they said almost jokingly, the gentleman book, this was like the project name, you know, and I was a bit, I thought, well, maybe gentleman will, will be a name for the book, which creates a distance towards someone in the bookstore. You know, when he looks at the book and he reads gentleman, he might think, oh, that's this not is me. Like, this is yeah, not for me. Yeah. It may be old fashioned, um, but somehow the t title is great because everybody seems to um, create something in his mind about a gentleman. And it seems that many more men try to or would like at least to be a gentleman, even if they, are, if they do not succeed every time. But I think it's, as you say in English, it's, you must give a dog a good name, I think. And that's, I think there's a saying like that. I mean, sounds good. Yes, no, it's a, it's a great perspective. So in an old interview I read with you the other day, which was just about 2000, 2001, you mentioned that your dream was to write a book about custom and bespoke clothing. And then uh, it took a little over 15 years to actually publish this book. So why did it take so long to, to, to write the second book? big book well it's not that i switched from using a computer to handwriting or something it's just that um, and it's not that i uh, that my speed of working had uh, slowed down over the years it's just that the publishing house was really a bit uh, cautious about the subject you know and i had to and uh, there were some technical things as well regarding my publishing house but basically my publisher said Mr. Ullmann, who is a fine gentleman and he knows a lot about books and he has published so many beautiful books and he said, well, Bernard, I like the idea and I like the subject, but I'm not sure that people will buy this subject. And then I said, well, you publish a book about Ferrari cars and people buy it, even if they only own a, a bicycle. So this was my point. And in the end, we finally decided to do it, and my publishing house decided to publish this book, and this is the reason why it took so long. And then I also did smaller books in the meantime, and, um, and in this case, the book was photographed by a photographer from Berlin, Errol Fritz, and he, he it took some time for him to travel around and to visit all the stores. Sometimes we went there together. So we really took the time to do the book, but as I said initially, initially um, it was not as easy to sell the book as the gentleman book because in the case of the gentleman book, it was just luck, I suppose. Yeah, I, I think you can never know enough. And even if you can't afford something, knowing the fine details will help you to identify things. And the process of seeing is really something that, that evolves over time because you can show two people the same picture and, and an experienced eye can point out all the flaws or the areas where there's a good fit, whereas the other pre person just sees a suit and that's it. And so knowing more simply educates you and helps you to make better decisions in the future. Um, I mean, not every man is made to be a to be a, uh, the customer of a bespoke tailor. I personally love to the whole process of fittings. But I also love to go in a store and buy something that I can wear immediately. And uh, I know many bespoke tailors who just admit that this is also great. You know, it's like two different worlds. Sometimes you go in a place and quickly eat a burger or a sausage or whatever. And, and then you go to a restaurant and have a five course meal. It's, it's something for different occasions and both things have their value and both things can be nice. You can go around on a bicycle and you can go around in a Rolls Royce car. You know, it's uh, it's just two different um, ways to get from point A to point B. Exactly. So I, I've read that, you know, you are now a big fan of Eduard Meyer shoes, which is a famous shoe house in Germany that is not so well known outside of Germany. Tell us more about them and their lasts. Well, Eduard Meyer is, 
I'm not very good at, at dates, but I think it's found, they found it in 1589 or something. It's the oldest existing shoe house in the world that still belongs to the same family. I think there's 13th generation and it's always the same family. And the, uh, they are very well known in Munich and around Munich and fairly well known in Germany, but you're absolutely right, they're not very well known outside these places, which is a shame because uh, they are, in my opinion, one of the best places to find off the rack shoes, off the rack shoes that fit very well because they have different shapes of last plus up to four different widths of shoes. So when you go there, first of thing, first of all, your feet will be measured and they look at your feet and I have seen several times when the shop assistant says, no, I'm sorry, sir, but we have no shoe for your feet. Sometimes people insist and they say, I want a pair of your, their own collection or they have different collections, all the great names they have in their store. Of course, they will not, they will sell it to them, but usually they insist on selling a, a well-fitting shoe. And I've, well, I was introduced to this, these last about 15 or 16 years ago by Peter Eduard Meyer, and he said, please, Mr. Wetzel, try my shoes, because I always wore church's shoes in those days. And I said, okay, I will try it. And his, shoe, his shoes are different, because usually they're narrower and longer than the shoes you usually wear. And they have a slight banana shape. I had a friend from Japan who tried these shoes, and he said, jokingly, I go bananas, which was a good joke, in my opinion. And, the, and when they first started with these banana shapes, of shoes, uh, people said, oh, they're ugly, these shoes. And many people from, from the clothing or shoe industry said, Peter, these shoes are ugly. You know, who wants to wear these banana shaped shoes? But now, uh, in the last 10 years, I've noticed many very traditional companies like Trickers, for instance, instance that they have also adopted a slight banana shape. And the whole idea of the banana shape is that your big toe, if you look at your feet, it, 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 it shouldn't be uh, forced uh, in, a, in a pointed shape. It should be always have the freedom to, to be straight, you know, and the other toes go like this. And so this is the whole idea. If, you, if your big toe is forced to the left or to the right, if you look at the other foot, um, your, the weight of your body will press it to the inside, which is not good. It's always important, and this is what many doctors also um, agree with, is that you take your big toe has the freedom to, to, to be straight. This sounds a bit technical and a bit like uh, when you go to a doctor, but it's very important. No, it makes, makes perfect sense. And it's, it's kind of funny that, you know, the Germans invented that because there is this kind of stigma that German style is, is, is unstylish or, or not elegant. And, and, you know, that function is more important than form. How would you say, or what's the state of classic style in Germany today? Well, um, I'm very happy about young people, you know, young men between 13 and 20. They are very much into classic clothes. That's, my, that's what I notice when I meet young people at book signing sessions or when I do lectures or speeches. So I have... I'm very positive and um, optimistic about classic style when I look at the young people. Then we have, of course, a big majority of people and the people who are between, let's say, 60 and upwards, many of them have no interest in classic clothes at all, which has various reasons. You know, it's still uh, sometimes, some people say it's caused by the 1960s um, revolution, you know, the students' revolution, the, the changes in, in society, which also took place in America in the 1960s. You know, they, they had long hair when they were young and they had blue jeans on all the time and sandals and a t-shirt and they just cannot picture themselves in a dark suit, you know, or, or even worse, in a navy blazer with gold buttons, you know, to them this is something, oh, this is, you know, a part, something, it symbolizes something that they just don't like. Um, but I see a lot of men between 30 and, and 50 who grew up with my books, many of them, and they are really very much into classic clothes, but the young people are the future. And 
they are sometimes more classical than myself, you know, than I am nowadays, you know. They sometimes quote from my books and they say, well, you said on page 26, blah, 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 and they quote it, you know, and I think, and if you look at the internet, maybe you have a similar uh, impression from the contact with your readers that young people are very much into this, you know. When I, ju I just remember the interview the, you did the other day with Ethan Wong, I believe is his name. What's his age? He's 19. Yes. And he's so classical, you know, it's unbelievable. And I watched this interview and I was really amazed about his enthusiasm. And I think a lot of young people out there are really interested in this because they just find, wow, these are different clothes. It, it makes you so much different. It makes you look so much different. All right. Now we talked a lot about Germany, style in general, but tell us a little bit more about you. What does a normal day in the life of Bernhard Rötzl look like? Well, I live in the country outside Berlin and I, uh, I have a family. I have five children and a wife and uh, we live in the country because it's so much nicer for the children. So, um, and I work from home, my office is in our house, we live uh, in an old house which is of course rather spacious because we need the space for our family and of course for my office I also need a, a little space. So I get up in the morning and as most people do, uh, most men do, I will go to my desk at some stage which is rather early in my case around eight o'clock in the morning and then I usually start writing and then at around 10 telephone calls start coming in because most people that I work with are journalists and people in publishing houses and they start working a little later and then a lot of telephone calls go on but usually it's 80 percent writing and researching and then uh, once or twice per week I travel, I go around to do lectures or workshops or seminars and so this is two days a week or sometimes it's half of the week, sometimes I have weeks where or months where I travel for, for a complete week, um, but it's traveling and writing, speaking and writing about style is what I do most of the time. Tell us a little bit more about what you do when you don't work. Well, um, I must admit that I'm not very much into exercising. My exercise is, is cutting weeds in, on our grounds or cutting the grass or um, I, we own our own chickens. I live in the country, as I said, and, and this means really country, you know. It's, uh, we have our own chickens, which is great for the children. My eldest son, he has the task to, to look after the chicken and of course I have to check what he's doing but he does a very good job of this and um, I like doing carpentry, thing, carpentry work and similar things because we have an old house and a lot of things have to be, um, you know, repaired and I like to do this myself. I'm, I'm a bit of a do-it-yourself craftsman and it's for some of my readers it's difficult to imagine this but you could see me in work clothes a lot if you came to my house uh, without an appointment and um, because I, I like to to work to to you know how, how do you call this hand handiwork or yes handwork mm -hmm. handwork yeah I think handwork is something that has fascinated me in different kind different ways I, I like to watch a carpenter work and I like to even watch a bricklayer work because if somebody does a good job in what he's doing, it's always fascinating to watch. And probably because my work is something that you can, cannot touch unless you see a finished book or see an article in a magazine, I'm probably fascinated by things that I can do with my hands that are visible. And then um, I'm, I'm just an ordinary family man and if you have uh, a couple of children, your holidays are, usually do not consist of going to Capri and sitting in the sun all day. It's you have to offer children a bit of more activity, a bit more activity, you know. And I like simple activities like going on a bicycle ride, which is again something that my readers cannot imagine me doing and maybe don't want to imagine me doing. But you know, as a father, you just have to keep your children moving. 
And so I, I rarely go on holidays. I like to go to the Baltic Sea in summer sometimes, but I, I travel so much professionally that I must admit that I'm not very much into traveling uh, in my spare time. I, I like to be with my family in my spare time and be at home because I'm a lot, I stay a lot in hotels, which you probably know what it's like. It's even the best hotel is not like your home. At, at least this is my, my opinion. I like to stay at home and um, I like cooking. I like wine. I like um, a good glass of gin and tonic in the afternoon or in the evening before dinner. Um, I like German beer, of course. I like also beers from other countries. I like a lot. I like food and drink a lot. Uh -huh. I like cooking and um, it's, um, I like both family cooking and I like cooking for my friends. I like to invite friends over to stay. You know, if you live in the country, you do not go out to restaurants so much. Um, restaurants are, for me, associated with work. Usually I go for business lunches, I meet people over lunch or over dinner, I'm invited for dinner or I invite people for dinner when I go to Italy, France or wherever. So I like to invite people, my real close friends to my house and cook for them or visit friends in other towns and stay at their house. This is, this is, what I, this is how I like to travel and this is what I like to offer my guests. It's a nice home cooked meal and good glass of wine and, and just a good conversation. Yeah, no, I, I love it too. Entertaining. And it's kind of a, a lost art form. But uh, on another note, what would, you know, your readers or our readers be surprised to, to know about you or learn about you? Um, yes, well, one thing that might be surprising, I, I like to play the guitar. And um, I don't know if this is so surprising in the United States. There are so many people who play the guitar and they play it so well because you have, and you have some of the best guitars in the world are made in the United States. And I remember saying to a man that I played the guitar and he, and he gave me a CD with classical guitar music. I do play the classical guitar a bit, but I mainly play um, rock and blues guitar and I play the electric guitar mainly and I own American guitars and this is just for the guitar geeks out there. I own a Telecaster, of course, a Fender Telecaster and a Gibson Les Paul and I play through a PV Classic 30 and which is probably means nothing to you, but it means a lot to people who play the guitar. So this is my hobby and, and uh, you could even see me on stage playing with bands. It's, it's uh, you know, I wouldn't want to compare me with someone as famous as Woody Allen, but in a very small way, like you could see Woody Allen playing the clarinet in a club in New York in the 1970s and 80s. You could sometimes see me on stage in certain clubs in Berlin or Cologne. Sometimes I take my guitar with me and then I join a band and I sit in and play with them, which is something I really enjoy because I love to have the opportunity to meet people for a change or sometimes who do not know what I do professionally. I love my job and I love to meet readers and I love to meet colleagues, but sometimes I just meet, like to meet people who just think or judge me by what, what I do in this moment. You know, just, just the guy who sits there and plays the guitar. And that's a great, uh, that this is really relaxing and great fun for me once in a while. Perfect. Thank you. So we always do kind of a little series, like quick yes or no questions. So I'm just going to run through them, okay? Um, Oxford or Derby? Oxford. This was not a yes or no question. Uh, fl flannel or worsted? Sorry? Flannel or worsted? Flannel. Necktie or bow tie? Necktie. Belt or suspenders? Can I say both? <laughs> sure, absolutely. Undershirt or no undershirt? No undershirt. Off the rack or bespoke? Depends, both. Okay, and uh, what uh, do you think we can expect from Bernhard Rötzl in the future? Well, I will keep writing books. Um, I'm talking about another book on shoes, which is, I can tell you this because it's, it's, it's nothing definite so far, but this is a project that I would like to do. I've done another book, one book about shoes, but I would like to do a bigger book on shoes because I find that 
shoes are the one single subject that fascinates men the most. Maybe you have a different experience from your from the feedback that you get, but I always find that when you speak about shoes and handmade shoes or Goodyear belt shoes, but also other types of shoes that most men are really interested in. You can, you can really uh, trigger the interest for classic clothes through shoes. And that's how many men, at least in Germany, start to get interested. So I would like to do some another book or book that focuses on shoes, not on handmade shoes, but on all types of shoes, but with a big, big chapter on handmade shoes and bespoke shoes, because this is a subject that I haven't dealt with you know, in a way that has, has, has satisfied me so far. In the gentleman book, there's a big chapter on shoes. And in my book, A Guy's Guide to Shoes, I've done that, but I would like to be, do a bigger book on shoes. And after I've seen some fascinating bespoke shoemakers in the last weeks, uh, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to sell this to my publisher in the moment, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you very much. Sounds exciting. And uh, in the meantime, if you want to check out uh, Bernhard Rösel's books, please head over to our written interview where we list them all and to you know the entire book series that he wrote. And uh, thank you very much for being on today, Bernhard. I really appreciate it. And thank I you, think uh, our readers learned a lot. It was a very good perspective and very unique and different. And I appreciate that. Thank you, Rafa. It was great talking to you. And um, keep up the good work. Thank you.